Welcome to Chronicles of Old Singapore. Uh, we are very happy to have with us today Anne Lim uh, to talk about uh, Bukit Ho Swee after the fire in 1961. We all know that uh, Bukit Ho Swee has this uh, you know, great tragedy in uh, 1961 with the biggest fire in Singapore history and it's usually been depicted as uh, you know, uh, the phoenix rising from the ashes afterward when uh, HDB built public housing uh, flats on the fire site and the fire victims were able to move back into the estate. HDB published a book uh, called uh, From Desolation to Progress. And so that's been the narrative of the Bukit Ho Swee fire. And, uh, you know, Bukit Ho Swee is very close to me. It was the place that, uh, a rough area where I grew up. Uh, in uh, 2005, I started doing a PhD on this very uh, fire and what happened after the rehousing when the fire victims moved back. It's published as a book uh, called uh, Squatters into Citizens uh, in 2013. Uh, so what we want to do today is to uh, maybe look behind the scenes of this main narrative and try to tease out, you know, the other side of Bukit Ho Swee estate. Uh, you know, I grew up there in various areas in Havelock Road and Jalan Mabina and eventually I stayed for many years at Indus Road. Uh, which was a one-room flat. It seems that behind the modern surface, uh, Bukit Ho Swee in many ways had some links to its past as an urban kampong where a lot of low-income people uh, lived. Uh, so there seems to be as much continuity uh, as well as change in the history of Bukit Ho Swee estate. And uh, no better person to talk about that than An Lim, uh, who was there in the early 80s and she worked at this little place known as Nazareth Center. But uh, I think it has a different name uh, by, uh, for the locals and local children. Maybe just to introduce quickly uh, Anne. Uh, she's an author also, and she wrote this book, which published in 1991 by Landmark Books, Face to Face, The Street Children of Bukit Ho Swee. So when I was doing my PhD and I saw this book, uh, the street children, right? That was, uh, I knew right away I had to speak to her. It is adopted today uh, as a literature textbook, I think, uh, in schools. Uh, so this is a companion uh, handbook. And I'll leave Anne to talk more about the book later on. Um, and, and this book was written out of Anne's experience at in Bukit Ho Swee with the children of Bukit Ho Swee in the early 80s. Uh, so welcome to the show, Anne. How are you this morning? Good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe as a way of getting to know you, uh, could you say how you came to be involved in Bukit Ho Sui? Okay, that was a very, very long time ago. Um, in Initially, I was a volunteer when I was, I think I was in the university and a group of us uh, found this place. It was then known as Nazareth Center and called NC for short. And uh, in brackets is the Bukit Ho Swi Community Service Project. And then, you know, it has gone through a few changes in the name. So um, I went there to just for my own experience of like, we can call it exposure to how people from, a, you know, uh, low income live or in that kind of neighborhood and that and I like being with working with children so I, I think I was like giving tuition or just playing with the children they they had children's clubs and things like that and then later um, a friend of mine in the same group who's a bit older she became she joined the staff so that at that time the 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 tiny this tiny place was just run by two people and one part-time uh, admin staff. Who is this so, friend? Uh, my friend, Angela. Angela, she, I didn't meet her. She she was in, I think you did, but uh, she was the assistant project coordinator and the project co coordinator was uh, Franciscan missionary, so Mary, sister, Mary Chua. Mm. Then Angela, um, 
she got married and she was expecting and so she she had to leave the she decided to leave the job and and I was I was just like you know I was I think I was a volunteer then so then I I decided to take over the position as assistant project coordinator. Yeah. Right. Uh, so this project, uh, could you kind of explain what this project was trying to do in Bukit Ho Swee? Okay. <laughs> I have to like jog my memory. Okay. Uh, basically, um, it was to, uh, there for, for the children and the youths to provide a safe place for them to hang out and, and to give them some uh, skills or, you know, to help them with this for example, with school or with education. And to also, you know, the, these were children and youths who were in exposed to um, or at risk, we call, would say, of being taken up by the secret society members or they, they could get into trouble quite easily. And um, they would be at this a lot of disadvantage because they would, most likely, if they were in school, they didn't, couldn't, you know, didn't make the grade or would drop out. So you have, you have school dropouts and you have what we call latchkey children. So, so it was a huge uh, challenge, but it's just like trying to uh, extend a, some service at this level and to be there for them to as an alternative to the streets. Yeah, basically, we we also had the privilege of getting the help of volunteers from the neighborhood and that's how the the center succeeded to a large extent because it involved people who understood the situation and who who were willing to give uh, as well you know take part in this project could you explain what what you mean by latchkey children yeah i mean it's just one of the terms uh around that time that was used for those children who would be left to their own devices because their parents would be working and nobody's at home and they just they they, they would have the key to their own flat and maybe it's like tied around their neck you know with a string uh, but somehow i think that was the term that was used in social work circles and then yeah they had the freedom to roam the streets, basically, and probably out of boredom and you know needing stimulation, um, they'll get into all kinds of mischief if they didn't have anywhere to go. To, yeah, to feel like accepted, also. Yeah, um, you mentioned earlier, Sister Mary. Yeah, so uh, this was a, a was this a project uh, from the Franciscan nuns? Francis the Franciscan nuns were part of the I think the history is that was started by a group of organizations and religious organizations were which also included, if I'm not mistaken, Buddhists and so it was it was like a mixed group of uh people who were interested to help help. But it's not like a religious it does, didn't come under a religious banner. But the Franciscan sisters happened to be there because they they have always been there to work with the poor and they they also ran like a kindergarten in a preschool i think and they lived in a in a small flat in the neighborhood itself so that was part of their mission and this was this was their work you know part of their work mm. uh i think you first Vo was it when you volunteered? Was that in 1982 or was that earlier? It was earlier. earlier. It was probably in the late 70s. What was your first impression of Bukit Ho Swee when you went there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I, it was like stepping into a different world. And, I, you know, I, I came from a different planet in the sense that I, although I... I can't say that I came from a wealthy background, but more towards lower middle class in the sense that we had we had education, good education, and and I was educated in a convent school, so it was like 
where everybody did well in school or more or less we did you know we didn't encounter much failure and we, we had the love and support of good teachers and the this one was the chij you know the ij sisters and then to suddenly come and but actually we, i think i did uh, i i was a teacher before and i did encounter in a government school for my posting a lot of mischievous behavior and quite chaotic classroom situations and that kind of disillusioned me about the education system then i think this was another step for me to further to try and understand the background of these children and how i can be of to be of help in, at a deeper level and where i could reach out to the children as human to human and not as some authority figure and how this did provide uh, gave gave me a lot of challenges to deal with and uh, yeah it was very enriching to learn you know this is this is another world but this is part of singapore yeah so this was about 20 years after the fire already and mm. uh, the children of the fire victims uh, you know mm. i think the if you are looking at uh, those people who were young men, young women at the time of the fire, they would have what, almost middle age already and they had uh, their children are growing up in school. So this is really two generations of people mm. in Bukit Hosea after the fire. Maybe I can just uh, show you some photos, your photos actually, uh, <laughs> that uh, you know you shared with me and I w was uh, so happy to be able to use them. Ah, uh, yes. So it says there Nazareth Center, right? Yes, so yes. With that, you know, very uh, characteristic window, isn't it? Yes. Could you see or you want me to try to? I think this is the max. Uh, no, I can see it. Mm. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So this yes. is, is this the entrance to the NC? Yes. It is. It's just that tiny, is that window and the door on the side of it. That's about the width and breadth, or what you call it, height and breadth of the entire place. So inside you have a, a next to the window was what was a room that we used as our office. And you just, I just had my desk by the window and there's like room for a, a big table in the middle and that's about it. Then you go in through that door, there's a tiny corridor the toilet on the right and you go right in there's another room a slightly bigger room and that's it so that's a room where we had time uh, we have low tables because it was also used as a kindergarten and and you know tiny chairs and the volunteers would sit there and and give tuition to the small groups of children but behind it there there is a like big collapsible metal door with a grill and at at the top of it, you have this kind of a window, a row of windows. From the outside, the boys, if they wanted to make mischief, they would climb on each other's shoulders, I suppose, and then they can peek in and, and they have like thrown things in, like water bombs or, or tried to. So it was, <laughs> it's like you, all the time, it was, you know, people, little boys and uh, youth would be trying to kind of... Uh, bombard us <laughs> try to come in and make make as much noise as they could just to get our attention i should think because they i think basically they felt left out or they wanted to be in but we didn't have enough space you know yeah, yeah th that's quite unimaginable right? i mean nowadays we have all these tuition center at the void deck of yeah. tv blocks but you i mean they are all quite quiet and you know uh, <laughs> yeah and this is quite a different kind of scene isn't it Yes, I mean, this picture is really very unique because it captures the scene on the outside, but they're, they're all, all very well behaved here. <laughs> ah, do, do you recognize any of the boys? Uh, no, it's too small, but like, you know, the slope yeah. uh, on the right, this, these boys, actually, that is a car park up there. Uh, there's a car park up there. And I yeah. think at night, you the little stalls will appear where you can... You can have cheng teng and those dessert, dessert stalls. Um, so when we come out, and you know, because my hours would be from afternoon to 
from two to like ten at night if we open and then you come out there you can have this I had, I wrote one chapter about this boy he approaching me and he kind of grabbed my handbag trying to test me I suppose so I just acted cool and then then I uh, kind of I think I said I was teasing him back and said you want to uh, have some cheng you know so he said oh you're going to treat me and uh, so in the end he just walked away peacefully it's like they you know they just want to test you to see whether you are going to react <laughs> and get angry with them mm. and i think when you show that you accept them as they are they you know you kind of like there's nothing to well, what's the word preempt the whole thing and and they they somehow you can they are a bit touched you know in that sense i think it's like you have made uh, some contact with them yeah, looking at these children, they like primary school students. They they are the age. To be the age, and then you see on the left where there's like a stone wo- low wall, which mm, yeah, what it's meant for. But people will sit there, and a lot of activity will be, uh, that's like used as a nice bench, and sometimes you have girls carrying the a child, a younger sibling, which is quite often. So so that you get those those type who have obviously they are given the care of the younger siblings. So they just take them with them everywhere they go. Um there's just there's just like so much of all these I think you know so many children around with all this energy and and they are given chores, like grown-up chores to do, look after your your younger brother and sister, or go to the supermarket and get this and that. So they, I think they learn to grow up very fast. And when actually all they want to do is to play, right? That's what children need to do. And uh, of course, education-wise, I think it's it doesn't help that they will, they go to school and they are they. I think that's where they get low self-esteem because they don't get affirmed and they, they can't sit still or, you know, the edu- having to study in English, I think is one of the main reasons or problems. Um, the reason why they cannot fit into school, the language is just too alien or foreign to them. And over there, you just hear mainly or oh, Hokkien and of course Mandarin because it's, you know, was being uh, used a, a lot. Hokkien, Mandarin, Malay. The Malay boys will pick up all the vulgarities from the Hokkien boys. Hokkien speaking. They they can speak Hokkien, but you know, <laughs> in unsavory <laughs> ways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when you call them the street children, what do you mean by street children? Well, that was just for the sake of a title, which was suggested. <laughs> but serious, I mean, really, they it's just to show that they wander in, they live in the streets quite a lot, you know, and they, we count the the neighbourhood streets as, as, as streets, uh, not like out in the main roads <laughs> so much. Right, right, yeah. Outside the house, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. probably it'd be, it'd be more like a neighbourhood uh, Neighborhood children, you know, who hang out a lot. What was uh, the demographic profile of the? Uh, so that seems to be more boys. Is that right? Uh, more boys who would appear to uh, so-called make trouble or who make themselves um, noticed, but the 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 quite the girls would come for. The tuition, yeah, mostly I think it's the girls who would be um, very keen or most you know serious about wanting to learn to so, or learn in you know in the school sense, schooling sense, wanting more schooling. Any help you can give them, they you know especially if it's free, then they can. And I think the uh, having that contact with adults who show care and affection was what made the the biggest difference 
because you can't really achieve very much in such a setting. They, they don't get to come every day because, you know, there are so many of them and they, are, they can come once a week. As, and then the volunteers also, you know, we need to get them to come once a week. And there was a group that we called the non-school goers group who never went to school because at that time, I don't know, I think is schooling compulsory no, it's nowadays. Not. Yeah, it's, it's still not, not no. because it was, I suppose it was not necessary. However, these were the ones who fell through the cracks and either they, they were forgotten by the caregivers, like some were being looked after by the grandmother. So they never went to school and there was, they were, so we had a small group of, I think they were mostly girls. In fact, all girls came. Mm. And we just had to start from scratch. And again, you you, you cannot expect great results. But, but they had this place that they could come to and, and, and uh, get some attention. And I think that was what mattered most. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I really like the original cover of the, you know, the, the first edition of the book. Maybe I just show right. it. Yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah. Because that that's a that's it's, actually a drawing, a painting I made. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah. Uh, You're also a very good artist. Graphs. So these are not real really from any you know, I mean you cannot identify as which child it was. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, the you know, the, the trying to climb and trying to to get attention, right? So these students are yeah. outside uh, NC. Uh, yes, this that window out from the outside because there's there's a ledge that they could climb on to. So, um, yeah, I think that's why I portrayed this. I made this sketch because it's really it really captures the spirit of these boys. It's it's only the boys who would do this, of course, because <laughs> you know they are more uh, active in and vigorous about these things. I mean, this is just a cultural thing, I suppose. I'm sure the girls would do it too if they had a chance. <laughs> do you think yeah. this is kind of symbolic? You know, trying to get in, you know, but being locked outside. As, yeah, as I a, mean, yeah. exactly. I mean, I think that was what I was trying to depict. And well, you know, the one at the back is a sketch. I mean, it's a pencil drawing. That is from a photograph mm. of a actual an actual boy and this boy has is the one in the story I wrote which uh, I I told about how he actually squeezed himself in through his head <laughs> he has this egg shape he squeezed his head, his head through uh, the bar space the space between the bar and he got in so and I happened to be sitting there in, at my desk right I said you you have to get up the same way you came in. <laughs> so he did the same thing. He, he squeezed. He first he would pat his, his overhead. <laughs> and then he squeezed himself out. And this boy is now a grown, grown up man <laughs> in his 30s, I think. Or is he already 40? I don't know. But he's, he has become a social worker. He did, you know, he's done very well. So he uh, he's one, one of... One of the people we are very proud of who, who came out of. Uh, was that Bing Huat? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. That wasn't Bing Huat. Ah, okay. No. That's Seng Chai. <laughs> okay, okay. I didn't know there's another. Bing Huat is a was a volunteer. He was not one of the the kids then. Mm, mm, mm. Although he lived in Bukit Ho Swee also, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I I think the best. The the most suitable or the most helpful volunteers we had were these young men who were in in their school days. I think they went to all the neighborhood schools and they managed to get enough education and of course and they were in the Boy Scouts in the Scouts mm. and they brought this knowledge and you know all the crafts and skills they learned to. In, interest the boys in this in this neighborhood when we had 
I think the most exciting or or uh, attractive uh, programs we had were the what do you call it the camps we we would hold like periodically. We'll take them to some place out outdoors where they could stay overnight, and then you know the children just love that, and they did all these very active, physically active outdoor activities. Which the Boy Scouts uh, volunteers knew what you know they knew what to do. Mm. They uh, they they would you know erect all these challenging uh, things from tree to tree. You can climb. They, the boys could climb and do all sorts of things. <laughs> Those were the days when the boys also loved to catch spiders. I know because once they visited me, I don't know how come, but <laughs> and I had a, a tree in my garden. A pakia tree, you know, as a pak pakia guava, and the the first thing they did was they raided my tree for spiders <laughs> and kept them in little match boxes, and that that's how they, in those days they still played with spiders, you know, the f- fighting why my spider will fight with your spider that sort of thing. Yeah, and the other thing that. they used to do would be playing, they played marbles, by. This was in Bukit Bukit Street itself, where you could, if you, they could find a bit of sand, like our the playground, know. yeah, probably. Right? Yeah, then they would just the way they played marbles was different from the way I played marbles with my cousins, my boy cousins, and all. In, in that, they would smash, try to smash the other person's marble, and I think they they use coins to gamble. You know, underneath the marble, maybe there's a coin or something like that. If you win, you get to take the person's coin. I vaguely remember that they they played this the way that they played marbles differently. Yeah, I I remember doing that too. So oh. actually, th- these are my time, you know. Uh, maybe they yeah. are slightly older than me. So now they will be in their fifties, all middle age already. Did Did you mm-hmm. ever follow up with some of them and see how they are doing? Uh well, I mean, Seng Chai was one of them, and. And some of them actually became our volunteers. So now I didn't go and follow up, but in particular, but mm. we did have some uh, get like reunion get togethers, and um, some of the girls, especially or, or or some guys, so the boys, girls and boys who were, were grown up, they came and joined us. So yeah, I think they're quite a number of them who have very fond memories of those days. Maybe I uh, should, mm. yeah, some of the other photos, I mean, from you uh, as well, right? The same one, uh, but this one is a bit interesting because you can see some older uh, youths, right? Walking away from uh, the center. And then mm. a group of ladies, I think, in the background here, sitting down and chatting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the one I was telling you about. Hmm. You think a couple of adults at the window, actually? Right? Maybe your colleagues? Or maybe you? I Which... can't see this yeah, photo. I, I can't see. It's not that clear. Uh, no? uh, yeah, and this, this is one the is... one you were talking about earlier, right? Yes. Yeah, this is very typical. And um, And this tells us the, the... Interesting to compare what the girls were like. Um, they were like, you know, the boys and the girls, they were like two different breeds, <laughs> two different kinds or categories of people. And I, I would imagine that it's because of the, you know, the culture, the culture of, uh, or the subculture of living in that kind of situation. The expectations made of girls were different from of the boys. And the girls, I think, would be given would have been given a lot more responsibilities with, yeah. you know, housekeeping and child taking care of children and all. Whereas the boys probably just like could do, go off and do what they like. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Disappear. And I, we, we had some extreme cases like the boy I wrote about who was chained uh, at home by his parents. If you remember, I one chapter on it. Yeah. I called him Buntat. That's not his real name. Mm. So he 
we we found out about him because anyway the other the other children will come and report to us things like that. Uh. So he was always chained to the leg of a table in the house in the living room, and the the father was a lorry driver. I. Uh, and the mother was a little bit unbalanced mentally. So he just like was like an animal chain to the thing, you know, to the table. But we were, and we felt very sorry for him. And then I found out a lot of things about why he, it was because he used to, if he was out, he would, he, or before he was chained, he used to wander in the streets and in Bukeo Street and, and beg. He was a little beggar boy and he got money and did his own things, you know. And then, so you obviously needed help. And that took up quite a lot of our, my time and attention. Yeah, his story is one of the really yeah. poignant ones in the book, isn't it? Yeah, I found out that his, actually his father was quite a kind man. It's just that he mm. had no, he felt like he had no choice but to do that. He's, he didn't know how to control or take care of his boy. And he was out busy, you know, working the whole day. Yeah, so uh, did the social welfare or any social worker get to the case to help him? Yeah, so I did all that connection and then, but I followed up in the end, we put him in a boy's home. It was it was a very long drawn thing, you know, so it was, there's not, there's only so much you can do because he, he had all kinds of issues mentally and, yeah, and he didn't go to school, he didn't have an education as well. He couldn't get much of he him. He couldn't get him to sit down and concentrate and do it. So he would be one of those who would climb up that window and sit at the window and try to talk to me and get my attention. <laughs> yeah. So he actually got to a point where I felt really quite frustrated and helpless. You know, it can be quite demoralizing because you can't do very much, and you have to be very strong <laughs> internally and externally. <laughs> What what was his uh you know your last contact with him? What was he doing? Uh well eventually, which actually was I can't remember so much, but eventually he he was out. But I think being in the home also didn't help because he probably got bullied. He was he went to children's home or um no, the boys' home, and then when he came back, he I think he would still. He was still hanging around the the center had moved to a larger premises in Jalan Clinic, and then now it's called Beyond Social Services. So, um, the you know the the staff and volunteers there, some of them still knew him. So that I think it was up to them whatever. Either I didn't follow up right to the end because I you know life, I couldn't follow. I didn't know what was. What happened to him in the end? 